California Arts Council and Beverly Hills Arts Commission, is the former West Coast editor of Andy Warhol's Interview Magazine and society editor of the Herald Examiner. Her cover stories can be read in Venice and Detour magazines, and she is a contributing editor to California Apparel News. For the next half hour, Joan will bring you inside news and views on society, art, film, and the exhilarating worlds of these multifaceted people. Here is Joan Quinn. Hello, I'm Joan Quinn, and welcome to Joan Quinn, etc. Our guest today is director Danny Houston, who comes from a long line of actors. His grandfather, Walter Houston, has his father, John Houston, his sister, Angelica Houston, and his mother, Zoe Salas. Did you ever consider acting, Danny? <laughs> <laughs> I think about it occasionally, but I think um, I, I prefer to be behind the camera, really. You still think about acting? <laughs> I do occasionally. I sort of mug in front of the mirror and things like that. But I, it's, it's, um, it's not something which interests me as much as, as actually making, making the film. But if anybody has a sort of a, pa a part of a villain, <laughs> I'd be interested in it. A villain? <laughs> just for a lark. You, you know, don't just look for like a villain. Damn. <laughs> <laughs> did, did directing actually uh, become intimidating for you because of this long line of directors? It was um, so natural that uh, oh. intimidation didn't even come into it. And, um, and one of the first actors that I directed was my father. Tell us about that. Well, um, I remember on the, on the, the first day he, he was um, doing the scene, he was a collector of souls in a film that I did called Mr. Corbett's Ghost. And um, I said action and he, he, he started the scene and then he fluffed a line and he said cut. <laughs> and I said, no, you, you can't do that. I'm, I'm directing the picture, you're the actor, and you can't say, you can't say, oh, I'm ever so sorry. Uh, and, he, and he was very, very nice to me and uh, really helped me a great deal on, on my first picture. What and a great story. Yeah. How old were you then? I was about 23 years old. So you, you, had you been on the set with him a lot, so you had a feeling of how he worked? Yeah, a great deal, a great deal. So I was by his side. And, Man Who Would Be King, Fat City, Wise Blood, Under the Volcano, Prissy's Honor. Some oh. great pictures, and he was, what a teacher to have. Were you an assistant along the way, or did you have uh, yeah. larger roles? <laughs> Occasionally I was an assistant, and um, during Under the Volcano, he, was, um, he wanted to do a title sequence with all, all these um, um, dolls from the Day of the Dead. And um, during, um, well, they were looking at rushes that one day, dailies, and uh, he turned around to me and he said, Danny, you're going to do the title sequence. And uh, it was a terrifying enterprise for me to go on. And um, at that time, I was about 18, 19, and I did this title sequence, which, um, which I was very happy with, and that was my first job. But, th but that was in Mexico, so it, it was, was a little bit easier for you to get the props and to, to from the Day of the Dead, yes. certainly, yeah. <laughs> well, they were all there. They just, they just threw all the props at me, and I shot the scene in the hotel lobby. Uh, mm -hmm. Give us a little rundown um, of your life, just to put us into perspective. Because a little I think rundown? You, yeah, a quick <laughs> rundown. You've lived everywhere, I guess. Well, I was, I was conceived somewhere around the time that my father was making Freud. I was born sometime around the time that my father was making the Bible. <laughs> and <laughs> very lived, heavy duty. <laughs> yeah. I lived in uh, in Italy and Ireland most of my life, and um, and uh, I went to art school. And after art school, I went to film school for a couple of years. And here I am. At one point, um, I read that you considered being a painter. I love to paint. Do you still paint? Occasionally, I do. Do you think it gives you a different vision when you're making film? Yes, it does. It certainly it helps a great deal. But the wonderful thing about painting is that it's something that you can do on your own and, and you don't require a vast amount of money. The thing, though, with painting is you put your soul on, on the line and people have to look at you and judge you from that one thing. And yet, I guess, in movies, it's kind of the same, isn't it? Kind of the same, but the, um, the input is from so many different people. I mean, you need to surround yourself by people that are very, very good at what they do. And this is a lesson I learned from my father. Um, actors, screenplay, crew. And so it's like an entire organism. And when it, when it, when it comes together, uh, hopefully it makes a good picture. 
Did, uh, do you speak Italian? I do, si, parlo italiano. Have you worked in Italy? Would you, have you made I, any I, films in well, Italy? Well, I just, I cut Colette uh, in, uh, in Rome. Oh, you did? Well, that's what we were going to talk about. Why Colette? How did you get interested in Colette? And tell us a little bit about well, her. Well, she's just had such a fascinating life, and there's so much, such a large palette that you can choose from from. Um, so vast. She knew so many people. She did so many things. And, um, and this part of her life, which is um, her first marriage to Willie, is, uh, is very fascinating because it's a relationship of manipulation. And Klaus Meir Brandauer plays Willie. We have the, a picture yeah. of the... Of this the is when they first enter Paris and, the, and their first honeymoon together. And it's, it's, uh, it's, it's just an incredible story and a sort of tale of manipulation. And he's, he's able to publish her first novels under his own name and makes a great success out of this. Oh. Um, and um, and it reaches up to the third and fourth novel. And it's so successful that he literally keeps her under lock and key and, and, uh, and has her write in this little room and won't let her out unless the book is finished. And, and you just had this fascination with it? Just well, it's a wonderful did something tale of exploitation. Did, did something else really trigger this story for you? Was there something in the past that uh, kept bringing this to no, life? No, no, no personal experience that, that I had. No, 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 absolutely not. I, I, read, I read the uh, Claudine novels um, when I was at school and um, had a sort of fascination about them. They're just so wonderfully simple, and yet under the surface lies all this sort of complication. And it's, um, it's very filmatic stuff. This is their first um, night together with uh, Polaire, who's Virginia Matson, And um, this is when Klaus Maria Brandauer, Virginia Matson, Willie, and Polaire seduce Colette, Gabrielle, the young girl from the country who's played by Matilda May. And this is the beginning of a little menage a trois. When you um, did, the, did the movie, where, where was it set? Where, where did you actually shoot it? Well, we shot the interiors in Berlin. We did the exteriors in Bordeaux for Paris. And um, I was able to swing it, so I cut the picture in Rome. Was it easy to cut it in Rome because of your Italian um, fluency? Yes, and, and absolutely, you know, it's, uh, to be in Cinecittà, which is the studio in Rome, um, and to, uh, to break for lunch and go up to Frascati and drink that white wine and the pasta and then go back to the editing room has got to be heaven. <laughs> did your father work there? Yes, he did. He did? What he did, did he work? He, well, he cut Freud there. And then he and then he, uh, he he started the Bible with Dino De Laurentiis. Well, it's great the way it all worked out, yeah, isn't little it? Little circle, yeah. Um, do you write at all? Occasionally, I write, but you see, with with something like Colette, you have so much uh, um, information to draw from, and her early novels, and so it's a question of sort of assembling one's life to make it dramatic, um, and so yet try and be tr true to it. Um, when I spoke about writing, I thought maybe because of the family background and having so much to draw from that you could just be writing a series of uh, family stories. Family stories, maybe somebody else should, should do that. But it's, it's, Usually, it's, though, if someone else does that, you're never sa quite satisfied. It's impossible to be satisfied, yeah. You're right. And they're so always going to read into it. it, so I have to do it. All right, you have to do it. <laughs> <laughs> when, when, mm. when you're not working on films, um, what do you keep yourself busy doing? Paint. Oh, you do? Yeah. You, you live in Los Angeles now? I live in Los Angeles, yeah. And do you have a studio? I don't. I paint at my home. I make a terrible mess. <laughs> plastic all over the place. <laughs> but it's, the, it's, the, it's, one, it's a wonderful way to... Um, and it's such a change from, from the film set where you have all these people, all this politics, all this stuff going on, to be able to spend some time on your own and, uh, and still be creative. Are you an abstract painter, or do you paint uh, figurative? For life? Figurative, oh. yeah, very disciplined, figurative. And color-wise? Color. Sometimes I use oil, but I prefer to use charcoal on paper. And are are you taking any going to school or doing? No, I did. I went to art school. I went so to. So you don't need to. Well, I, I'm sure I need to. Yeah, <laughs> sure I need what to because it's a hobby. So I don't need to be all that great at it. I can just dabble. And and since you've been all over the world, do you find travel en enjoyable? It's, I think, one of the best investments that one can make with one's time and money is to travel. 
Absolutely. It's, it's, it's uh, at times when I'm, I'm happiest. I'm a sort of gypsy at heart. I know you spend a lot of weekends away at, uh, I don't know, mid-California. I don't know what area you call it's near, it. It's near the Sequoia National Park, my sister's ranch, yes. And, and what do you do when you're up there? Ride most of the time. Oh. She has these beautiful Arabs there that we go and we, we take them up into the hills and we go riding and, and, and then we go and visit Giorgio Armani, the pig. Who's this? Viet <laughs> who's a Vietnamese pig? <laughs> Giorgio Armani. <laughs> I didn't know he was in the Sequoias. <laughs> and uh, he's a great character, old Giorgio. And it's uh, a real person or it's a pig? <laughs> what is this? Wait a minute. <laughs> I will never tell you. And uh, then we plant a lot. We plant a great deal of trees. So do you? Oh, trees. But what about vegetables? And do you farm? Vegetables. We farm. I made this basilico, uh, uh, this pesto sauce. Uh, the other day that was to die for. Tell us about it because when the Masonis were here they gave us one of their secret recipes <laughs> and since you are so well versed in Italian <laughs> we need something from you. Well you just you put you put the basil in the blender a couple of cloves of garlic pepper salt mix it all up oil of course good extra olive oil and that's it that's basically it's about that simple but it all has to be fresh. And, and you grow that in your garden there? Big bushfuls, you yeah. know. Oh, that's great. Yeah, well, the next time you come back, um, you have to bring your paintings, you have to bring some pasta, and before we leave, I want you to tell me what you think the perfect lifestyle would be for you. Well, I think some sort of like Gauguin like lifestyle, I think, would be absolutely perfect. I'd like to be painting and have sort of native women all around me and, and, uh, and uh, sort of a glorious blue ocean. Uh, that I could just jump into occasionally. When, um, I, was <laughs> <laughs> when I was reading the Grobel book, Larry Grobel's book, well, I don't know what you think of it. It's all right. It's a, but it said um, the young Danny Houston liked women and painting. And I think Is that it, what he said? Yes, I, or oh, somebody dear. said it about you, so this summed well, it all up. I can't deny it now. <laughs> <No>. <laughs> Well, I want to thank Danny Houston for being with us. Lots of good luck on all of your movies that will be coming up. I know thank we'll you, be John. seeing you for a long time. Thank you. And we'll be right back after the break. Thanks for waiting. Hi, we're back and I'm Joan Quinn. I have with me producer Chris Beard. He's featured in Jeffrey Robinson's book, The Risk Takers, a survey of money, ego, and power. Chris Beard is listed along with the late media mogul Robert Maxwell, entrepreneur Sir Terence Conrad, and eccentric Richard Branson, the founder of Virgin Records, which he sold for a billion dollars, the megastores, the Virgin megastores, and of course, Virgin Atlantic Airways. Chris doesn't seem to fit into this field. He's produced hit TV shows like Sonny and Cher, Andy Williams, and Bob Hope. Chris, mm -hmm. how do these hits fit into this risk-taking label? Well, I think that, uh, you know, um, when we did, uh, especially the Andy Williams and the Sonny and, and Cher shows, which were back in the 60s and 70s, that uh, what, it was what we did with the people. That, that was the risk. I mean, we took Andy, who'd been singing Moon River, and uh, as he was singing Moon River in our version of the show, the moon fell down and uh, the set fell down, and Andy sort of was uh, in shock sort of thing. And uh, it was kind of the shock value of changing the images of the stars of those days. You That's know. how you got your yeah. viewers? Well, uh, <laughs> I, was, I was originally one of the writers on The Laugh-In, and, uh, you know, that was a real risky show when it came on because nobody knew what the hell that was going to be sort of thing. And I understand 
when George Schlatter came to you because he needed someone who could keep riding and riding and riding? Yeah, we, we, we uh, had to hang out in this motel and, you know, uh, there were about 13 or 14 riders and uh, I used to write most of the stuff for Artie Johnson, all the sight gags and very interesting and all that stuff. So you yeah. created those yeah. uh, sayings, yeah. so to speak. Well, I helped, <laughs> yeah, let's say. Yeah. Well, it was, it was a definitely a team effort, yeah. But it must have been also um, burnout, having to come up with new things all the time. Well, right? George was like, he had this big whip out all the time. I know and, how uh, George yeah, is, yeah, with his and big smile exactly. and his whip. But, uh, you know, he, he uh, we, we had the, I, I think, remember that as being the most fun of all time. And I know today, if I bump into Goldie or anybody from the cast in airports and things, we all revert back to the way we were, like, uh, they, we were like the children of comedy in those days. Yeah, it was, have, a, it was you, fun. Have you had a reunion? Uh, you know, George is going to do a comeback reunion laugh-in, something or other, I don't know. He hasn't called on me yet, so maybe it's uh, do way off in the distance. Get everybody together. All oh, that? they'll all show up. Definitely <laughs> for that. Yeah. Well, you started writing laugh in mm -hmm. as far as the TV in mm -hmm. uh, here in mm -hmm. in uh, Hollywood, mm -hmm. and. You just told us about Andy Williams. What did you do for Sonny and Cher that kept it? <sighs> well, you know, when we first uh, were asked to do Sonny and Cher, it, they were like um, sort of like two kids that were had had their day and were sort of looking around for the next uh, the next shoe to drop. And Fred Silverman, who was with uh, CBS in those days, he. Uh, told us to go and see them. And we went to Dallas, I remember, and we saw their nightclub act, and we thought, hmm, should we do this or not? And we decided, we decided to do it because, well, at that time, we didn't have a gig, and so that sort of decided us. And so we did this summer show with these two, and they didn't give us a lot of money, and they gave us a very little set of offices, and we found all these strange people to put with them. And so I suppose the biggest risk there was we were all risking our reputation on two <laughs> sort of uh, used-up rock and roll stars. Oh, yeah? they were already, they'd already, they'd already had the, oh yeah, oh, that, that had been a long time before. And so, you know, when we started getting those big ratings in those first few years, that was the most exciting time, you know. I remember seeing a picture of Sonny and Cher with Chastity on the front cover of Life magazine and thinking, and with Bob Wood in, of, of, of CBS in the picture and thinking, I think the show's going to run for five years if you can get the president of CBS on the front cover of <laughs> that Life. Was, yeah, exactly. That was good. <laughs> then with Bob Hope, is a pretty big name. Yeah. So we don't have much risk taking there. It seems. No, well, you know, strangely enough, I was the first uh, new producer that Bob had used after using this uh, same producer for the last uh, 20 years, and uh, I had a big red beard there, and, and I had kind of hippie kind of hair, and I was kind of like <laughs> something from outer space as far as Bob was concerned, and um, so the risk there was that I remember the first meeting I, I had with Bob, and he asked me, um, well, what would you do if you uh, were doing this show? I said, well, I thought I was, and then I realized <laughs> he was the total... I'd one man show, you see. <laughs> so I said, well, I'd cut down the opening monologue from 15 minutes because uh, I remember uh, that we were up against the $6 million man in those days and that uh, this guy had already, uh, you know, defeated Poland and knocked over three or four buildings <laughs> and uh, and Bob was still standing there telling jokes and that's what I said to him and uh, he looked at me and writers were diving under the table and saying, this guy's gone, he'll be out there tomorrow. And, uh, you know, it took a couple of days and Bob came back and said, you know, let's cut down the opening monologue so you know risks are it's it's sort of like wh what is it's an intrinsic thing what is a risk well a risk is if you put your ass on the line I suppose you know he took he took your idea sifted it through his mind and then came back yeah but and that's idea. what he was paying me to exactly. do to tell him what other people probably wouldn't dare to tell him I suppose yeah well by the time you got to TV you had moved from England to Australia mm -hmm. which I think is a risk in itself it is it is, it is. <laughs> and uh, <laughs> Australia is a risk that's yeah, what yeah, I mean. Yeah. And you worked in radio, uh -huh. and you were on camera. Yeah, I had my own kids show for many, many years. Um, and that was a very interesting experience because it was the first time any Americans who would come down there to tour in Australia <laughs> in the clubs, they would turn on the TV in the afternoon and they would see my afternoon kids show. And uh, my show was called Small Time. You know, and what I do is that I was re I was reading Dr. Seuss books uh, with a live jazz band behind oh. me, and it really worked great because you know we had all the uh, the Dr. Seuss books open, and we'd pan across to the pictures, and then we had this music, you know, and it really worked with this sort of strident uh, 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 striding bass and <laughs> and everything, and the kids loved it, and so the Aussie kids they they were hip. 
they were hip to the to the jazz. But did you do it in an Australian accent? Were yes, I can I can speak with an Australian accent. You see, I see. I used to speak like this. <laughs> what I don't anymore? And from there you went to Canada. Do you have a Canadian accent? Well, they were out in the boot. They were out in the basement the Saturday in the maple leaves. Yes, yes. So did you work under that with those guys? No, no. <laughs> uh, you know, most Canadians speak more or less like people here. But I had a show in Canada called Night Rap, the Nightcap. That was a very successful show, and it was kind of like a late night satire show. And people like Lorne Michaels and people like that used to write for that show. Is it was that a, right? Oh in yeah, Canada? it was a it was a very popular show for four or five years. And as a matter of fact, that's where George heard about me, uh, George Schlotter, because I was writing this satire show up there. But was that TV or radio? That was TV. Oh, that was yeah, TV, was, too. Yeah. So do you think that borned Saturday Night Live in a way? I won't say that. <laughs> <laughs> Can I say that? <laughs> I know also, uh, I don't know if it was before Sonny and Cher or somewhere in there, you teamed up with Dick Clark. Yes, I've had some... Who is, I think, just the monument of television. Well, Dick Dick, Dick is a guy who has his eyes right where they should be on television. He has his finger on the pulse. And, you know, he's been around for so many years that there's uh, almost nothing that he doesn't uh, uh, see first, yeah? And then it's a matter of trying to persuade everybody in the networks to see it along with us. But I had a very successful run with him. We did a show called The Half Hour Comedy Hour where we put Arsenio Hall on the air for the first time. He was the yeah. star of the show. And uh, Jan Hooks was in that show for the first uh, time as a, as a series performer. And uh, Victoria <coughs> Jackson, and they all went on to do Saturday Night Live, and a lot of the writers went on to be quite well known in uh, in sitcoms. And then, of course, we did our big show, Dick's show uh, that I created uh, with his company, uh, putting on the hits, which was the lip sync show. Oh right! And, and, and that went on for like five, six years. Yeah. That was wonderful. What about the Gong Show? Well, I uh, <laughs> I uh, didn't have too much to do with that apart from creating it and doing the pilot, and uh, then uh, sort of Chuck did the rest. But uh, Chuck. I had. Barris. Chuck yeah, Barris. Chuck, yeah. but, but the thing was, you had to create something. You were looking at all these great TV shows, and how did you come up with the idea? Well, I always thought that um, it, the American uh, public was ready. I mean, everybody likes to put a lampshade on the head at a party <laughs> and sing uh, Swanee River sort of thing. <laughs> and uh, I always thought that the American public were ready to be on television. Uh, and, and of course, since the Gong Show, all of these other shows that have um, um, come on uh, have sort of uh, reiterated that point very um, strongly. Uh, or even today, uh, the Geraldo show and all of the, mm -hmm. the Donahues, I mean, these people are standing up and saying things about their lives that are positively unbelievable, you know. And so it's really the gong show of words what's going on now, yeah. The great thing is you, you talk about people talking about themselves. There's one person who doesn't talk about himself very much. It's Michael Jackson. And mm -hmm. you worked with Michael long ago. Yes. We, well, we did the first special. Uh, my ex-partner and I, who I'm still very friendly with, it's not one of those ex-partner things, um, Alan Bly, uh, we were doing the Sunny and Cher show. And uh, Michael Jackson and uh, Barry Gordy at that time came to us and asked us if we would uh, do a show with the Jackson Five. And uh, of course, we liked them very much. But Michael, I think, in this clip you're going to see, was only about 11 or 12. Look, can we see it now? Yeah, sure. We're going to see it. <laughs> And let's go! Was that a, a show or? A that was a special. That was the first uh, special they ever did. And uh, Michael was quite amazing. He would ask us all these questions, everything. Uh, he'd write everything down about chroma key, about how people stood on the set and what the, all the lighting really? was about. He was amazing. He used to call us at home. And so, you know, we used to say, who is this little dude, you know, way back there? So, uh, so he's been yeah, really into yeah, it for a long time. For a long time. time. The other thing is, I know you, 
you worked with Elvis. Yeah. And did you really work with him, or was he one of those figments of your imagination? Well, you know, the first time we met Elvis was in a room, and uh, it was like a figment of our imagination because it, he was larger than life. You know, um, he was so perfect at that time of his life. He was like uh, at the peak. You know, and uh, we. I spent six very, very intense weeks with Elvis, with Steve Binder, and uh, you know, Alan Bly, and uh, all the other people that run that show. Um, Bob Finkel was the executive producer, but um, I remember Elvis being one of the best experiences that you could possibly imagine. He was such a pro and <laughs> such a great guy. What did you do with him? Was it a show? Oh yeah, we did the 68 Elvis comeback special, the, uh, the one oh. with the black leather where he sat in the oh. thing. Yeah, Which is one. now a part of documentary history, right? God, I hope so. Yeah. I, I always wanted to feel <laughs> like a part of documentary history. <laughs> you, at a time... I want to be an archive. You, you, I think that was an archive. <laughs> and Michael Jackson too. Uh, at a time, um, we're talking really about the past, uh -huh. and you had the foresight to think that variety shows were dead. Well, actually, they were dying. dying. MTV and and the way that uh, that came alive sort of killed the traditional variety format. And so, uh, you know, we just sort of moved away from that into other areas. I mean, you can't uh, flog a dead horse, so to speak. Maybe one day it'll come back. Do you think that it will run full circle I don't like think the so. fashion? I, I don't think our variety shows kind of work anymore. I think uh, in Living Colors, a half hour variety show, I think maybe it works in a half hour form, but not an hour form anymore. Where do you see TV going then at this Well, I hope uh, the way I want it to go. And at the mm -hmm. moment, it's, uh, it's sort of on hold. It's like just before there's a major change, and we know that with art, we know this with everything, that just before there's a major change, uh, you tend to have everyone resisting the change uh, tremendously. And then the floodgates open and brand new vistas appear. Um, why um, uh, nothing is new? And everybody says, why haven't we got anything new? It's because we're 1993 almost, and it's the end of the 80s almost. The, the, last, the first two years of the next decade are usually people fighting to stay uh -huh. the same. Uh -huh. And of course, the Clinton election and things like that are, have started to make the change happen. And I see in the next couple of years some amazing changes taking place where people who are running the TV realize, will realize that there are other ideas out there that can make a lot of money and are not like what is being done now, you see. Well, we're finished. <laughs> <laughs> you finished us. <laughs> you brought it all together. <laughs> and we'll be looking for your predictions. <laughs> thanks, Chris Beard. And thanks for being with us on Joan Quinn, etc.